This is Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Tim Stenevec on Bloomberg Radio. Ari Alstetter, he is Canada real estate reporter at Bloomberg News, and he joins us from our Toronto bureau. Um, Ari, you know, it's funny, not funny. We've been talking about this story a lot in the newsroom because it really seems to potentially have some significant consequences for how we look at India, um, geopolitically, and just a lot of other serious issues. But again, we laid it out briefly, but tell us about, you know, maybe even the conversations you had with Jill Weber, the editor of the magazine, about why we had to do something on this story. Right. Well, like you said earlier in the program, I think for an international audience outside of Canada, this really has been flying under the radar. But that um, really undersells how important it is. Because as you say, India was really looked to or has been being looked to by you know Western democratic countries as a potential democratic counterweight to the rising power of China, uh, a, a billion-person country that uh, is in Asia that uh, Western democracies could look to to uh, um, sort of represent their values in the region and, and champion those values in the region. The problem with that for the last few years is that even as uh, Western countries like the U.S., uh, France, the U.K., and Canada have been trying to cultivate uh, India as a, a friend, uh, the government of Prime Minister Narendra Modi has taken a, a liberal turn back home. Uh, uh, opposition uh, politicians, journalists, uh, minority communities have said that uh, uh, Mr. Modi and his uh, nationalist, Hindu nationalist BJP government has uh, cultivated a climate uh, where speaking out, speaking against the government line is a risky thing and could incur uh, legal penalties, uh, harassment, uh, uh, all sorts of unpleasantness uh, um, from the state uh, to, to try to induce people not to do this. Now, expediency sort of allowed or demanded that these Western countries turn a blind eye to this for as long as it was happening uh, in India. But the murder of a Canadian citizen on Canadian soil is something uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau couldn't mm. look away from. And, and that puts his allies in the U.S. and, and the U.K. and France and the other countries in an awkward situation, too. Uh, because on the one hand, you know, killing each other's citizens is really an unspoken rule. Uh, 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 there's really an unspoken taboo against this among all these Western countries. India violated this. Uh, so what do you do with that as you want to continue to cultivate India as a friend? So that's a, a really good really good context for the background and the backdrop of, of this assassination earlier this year, back in June. Let's go back to who Hardeep Singh Nijar is or was. Well, right. He, he was a Canadian citizen. Uh, he owned a, a plumbing business in, in Surrey, British Columbia. Uh, he had a, a wife and, and two uh, adult sons. Uh, he was also president of, of uh, his uh, Gurdwara, which is uh, the, uh, the Sikh temple. Um, but uh, most relevant is he was a vocal supporter of, as you say, Khalistan. Uh, this movement to establish a Sikh homeland in Punjab. And, and most important, he was one of the leaders of uh, this activist effort uh, to stage unofficial referendums in the Sikh diaspora around the world uh, on Khalistan, putting votes uh, to people who are part of the Sikh community. Uh, do you believe there should be a, an independent Sikh homeland, uh, an independent Punjab, yes or no? Uh, these these votes, the, the group that uh, uh, put these on, that, that uh, uh, Mr. Niger was a part of, uh, Sikhs for Justice, have staged these votes uh, um, in, in Sikh communities around the world, um, uh, including uh, the UK, Austria, Australia, uh, Switzerland, others. Um, and actually, uh, in April uh, of um, this year, uh, Mr. Niger got up during a, a Sikh festival in front of his Gurdwara and said that the referendum would now be coming to British Columbia. Uh, um, mm -hmm. A few months later, he was killed. Um, and, right, what, and, all right, you know what I, 
Mm. Oh, I'm sorry. Please go ahead. Please. Well, I, I, what I, I, thought I was, was just going to finish. Yeah. yeah, please finish. That's right. Continue, please. My apologies. Well, what I no, thought no, was I, interesting, I, what you said at the at the beginning. I'm going to go. I'm going to go for a second just because we're... Please. <laughs> cause jump what I in, think jump was, in. was interesting... No, but because I, we really have been talking about this in the newsroom because it has gotten buried um, among so many other headlines. And I think about what you said at the beginning. India has been looked at as a democratic counterweight to the rise of China. You know, we're living in an era where geopolitics and I feel like geopolitical relationships are being, you know, rethought, or, you know, and we're, we're definitely seeing increased pushback against China. And so what I'm wondering is, as you did this story and looked at what happened um, to him, you know, what are you finding out about what's going on in the Indian government? Because Prime Minister um, Modi has said the allegations against him in connection with this or his government, absurd, right? And he calls certain individuals terrorists. But what have you been finding out in your reporting? As again, we increasingly look to India as maybe that's the partner, the next big partner for the world. Um, what have you found out? Well, our colleagues in India have, uh, um, you know, uh, looked into what the reaction to this story has been in the country. And, and interestingly, uh, it's produced a kind of rally around the flag effect. Right wing media is very uh, powerful uh, in India and, and, and many of the media, uh, in part out of this sort of broader climate that uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi and the BJP have cultivated, many media have uh, fronted uh, more right-wing voices in their coverage. And, and these kind of commentators uh, have been very much uh, uh, denouncing Canada, uh, proclaiming uh, um, uh, Hardeep Singh Nijar as a, as a terrorist, and saying that the killing was justified, pointing to uh, the U.S. Uh, saying the U.S. conducts drone strikes on uh, people it considers terrorists in other countries. Why shouldn't India be able to do the same? Uh, India labeled uh, Hardeep Singh Nijar as a terrorist uh, and, and said that he was involved in a plot to uh, kill a Hindu priest in Punjab. It had earlier accused him of having... Uh, of. Uh, leading Sikh activists or, or, or Sikhs into terrorist training camps in British Columbia. The thing is, by their own admission, the, the Indian government, from our sources, from our discussions with them, uh, brought that latter terrorist training camp allegation to Canadian police. Canadian police checked it out and determined that uh, they were just going to a shooting range uh, outside of Surrey. Mm. The community where they were going, the mayor, when he got wind of this, spoke out and said it was absurd that there was a training camp nearby, uh, any kind of terrorist training camp nearby. Mm. So the issue with, with a lot of the allegations coming out of the Indian government seems to be proof and also that if there was proof and if there was uh, um, strong evidence, there is an extradition process. Uh, charges can be brought in India, and you can apply for extradition from Canada. Canada is a place where there is rule of law, um, unlike the places where the U.S. has conducted its drone strikes, uh, Yemen, Somalia. It's very hard to extradite uh, someone out of Yemen. Uh, for Canada, it's not such a big problem if the, uh, uh, it meets the standards of evidence for Canadian law. Um, the Indians seem to don't make much of this. Uh, argument, which is essentially what mm. the Canadian government has been saying, uh, and and deem uh, or accuse the Canadians of ignoring their complaints about uh, the activities of people like uh, Hardeep Singh and, uh, and and just not doing anything about it. And and so our sources within the Indian government say that that prompted them to uh, take matters into their own hands, or, or at least decide that. Niger was a problem that had to be addressed. Well, what do we know about the actual crime that occurred, the assassination here? Who, what do we know about who exactly was behind it, and how are people being held accountable? Well, we don't know who's behind it. What we have is the Canadian allegations, uh, or the allegations by the Canadian government that uh, India... Uh, the government of India was behind it. We do know details of the crime itself as it occurred. 
Uh, we know that uh, it was a Sunday evening uh, um, in Surrey, uh, Father's Day in, in June. Um, mm -hmm. Hardeep Singh Jar uh, at around 8 p.m. was leaving the Gurdwara after a, a day of working there as the president, uh, giving his Sunday speech and the like. Uh, he was driving out uh, sort of the back uh, exit of the Gurdwara parking lot. As he was driving, um, Gurdwara security cameras capture a, a mysterious white sedan seemed to start moving as soon as he did, uh, pulled in front of him on the road out, uh, and then stopped right before uh, the exit to the Gurdwara merged into uh, a larger road. Um, when that car stopped, it forced uh, Hardeep Singh Najjar to stop, and then two uh, people in black, two men in black, uh, emerged uh, from the side of the road and fired into the driver's seat window of Niger's truck. Uh, the firing continued for around five seconds, maybe a bit longer. As soon as the firing started, that that white car uh, pulled out of the out of the Gurdwara and drove away. And then the two gunmen stopped firing and they started running. Witnesses saw them running mm. and uh, witnesses who I spoke to, uh, three people pursued them, uh, followed them into a park um, nearby. One says that one of the, uh, the gunmen, uh, they were dressed all in black. They had uh, black hoodies on and they appeared to be concealing, holding something in their pockets, in the front hoodie pocket. And uh, one of mm. the, uh, the gunmen uh, pulled a gun out uh, and, and threatened one of the pursuers, uh, then proceeded deeper into the park. The pursuers, after hesitating uh, 20 seconds or so, continued and caught up just in time to see the two gunmen still masked get into a silver uh, sedan uh, mm -hmm. that was parked in a cul-de-sac right at the end of right. the park and then drive away. And so that's what we know. Uh, the police have right. have released a lot of this information. The white sedan is still a mystery. The police identified the silver car as a 2008 Toyota Corolla and asked for information about that. Right. Uh, identifying right. the the driver of that as another suspect. And that's pretty much where it stands. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately, we have to run. There's so much rich detail in this. Um, story and it, it reminds me of the complicated relationship that the world has had with China over the last 20, 30 years and now you wonder if it's just a repeat with India. Ari Alstetter, thank you so much.